Hi, I'm Neeraj and this is The Joy of Creating Art with Code. A little bit about myself, I'm currently a sophomore student at Ashoka University where I'm pursuing computer science. Moving forward, these are the points for discussion, the generative art, its principle and elements, the history behind generative art, the geometry, algorithms and randomness that frames our generative art. We'll be seeing a lot of examples using processing and PyCairo and we'll be ending the talk using genetic algorithm and GANs. So what exactly is generative art? An art created through the use of an autonomous system is simply generative art. Generative art uses iterative commands to draw vector-based shapes to the screen. Most of the art created draws inspiration from the modern art, especially pop art that makes heavy use of geometric patterns. An autonomous system is always required, otherwise it's more of a digital art. And randomness is one type of autonomous system, so the design created is unique each time. Here the role of an artist is to design the process that includes some sort of autonomy like the artist controls the randomness and the order in the art. So we can say that the elements of the art are provided by the system and the principles on which the art will be created is provided by the artist. While creating an art piece, one must understand and apply the building blocks of art and these are the elements and principles. When we talk about elements of an art, these are the things that are used to create an art piece and these can be used either individually or in combination for any art making endeavor. In an art piece, visual elements would be color, form, line, shape, space, the randomness and the texture. Color is basically the hue, the value which is the lightness or the darkness, the intensity of the color used. Form is the element of art that renders a 3D art form into 2D and has some volume and could be geometric or organic. The textures can be perceived as surface quality of a work of art and it defines the way an art object feels. The principle is the rhythm, the contrast, movement, proportion and harmony. So the rhythm is the movement of an artwork. Contrast means the difference between the elements like color, value, texture, size. Movement is all about how our eyes move through an art piece and proportion means that some objects can be smaller and some objects can be bigger in an art piece. And all of these together creates an art piece. So in the previous slide, we saw an art piece named Substrate by Jared Tarbill. And if we use all the principles that we discussed in the previous slide and put together, we can also create something like this art piece that you can see here. The idea behind this is pretty simple. We will start with some random points on the canvas then we start drawing lines to some random directions but as soon as we uh, as soon as these lines collide with each other it starts creating new lines at an angle of 90 degree so the exciting thing about this is the emergence of art comes to be really different each time the program is run and this piece that you can see is created using python in processing so let's talk about the history of generative art in analog art which is the art manipulated by hand, complexity and scale requires exponentially more effort and time. Computer excels at repeating processes near endlessly without exhaustion. As we will see, the ease at which computers can generate complex images contributes greatly to the aesthetic of generative art. One major challenge faced by the early generative artists was the limitation of output devices. So the primary source at those times was a plotter a mechanical device holding a pen whose movement were controlled by the um, controlled by the instructions that were programmed in the computer plotter drawings were typically black, black and white on paper and as such most of the early works produced was black and white even after the printers began to be used one of the first artists to produce plotter drawings in color was Frieden Nick and whose art piece can be seen here which is known as Homage Plot Paul Klee in 1965 so this piece of art named Homage is typically based on a painting by Paul Klee entitled High Roads and By Roads. Friedenick took Klee's expo exploration to proportion and the relationship between the horizontal and vertical lines and ellipses as the backbone of the piece. He adds a lot of randomness on the size, scale and proportion of lines and ellipses uh, on a pen plotter. And if we make such similar decision and put the commands into the system, we'll get something similar outputs that you can see on the screen. Uh, these are the replicas of homage created in processing in Python. 
One of the earliest and best known pieces of generative art is Schotter by George Nies in 1968. Schotter starts with a standard row of 12 square and gradually increases the magnitude of randomness in both rotation and location of the sequence as we move down the rows. Generative art is one of the best options to create such art pieces because imagine for a second that you draw the image above yourself using a pen and a piece of paper and it might take you an hour. On the other hand, providing some simple commands to the computer, we can create thousands of such pieces in a couple of minutes and with a unique touch each time. These two art pieces are created by Vera Molnar, who is a French media artist. She is one of the women pioneers in the field of generative art. The majority of people in those early decades of computing had little to no contact with computers or frame of reference outside of science fiction. Against this backdrop, a large number of female generative artists emerged and making key contributions to the craft and the community. This art piece is called Florida and it's created by John Maida in 1990s. John Maida is another famous personality in the field of generative art. He was the president of Rhode Island School of Design and professor at MIT Media Labs. He's created a lot of awesome artworks and have worked with people like Ben, Cray, ben Fry and Casey Rees. And Fry and Rees took Mida's uh, design by number and eventually built their own free platform that could be shared outside of universities and used by anyone with an interest of learning to sketch with code. And this turned out to be the birth of processing language. Ben Fry and Casey Rees are the founder and who have been working on processing over the last 19 years and it has been the preferred platform for the best known generative artist. Processing is uh, basically a programming language and environment built for the media arts communities. It is created to teach fundamentals of computer programming within the media arts context and to serve as a software sketchbook. And it's been used by majority of students, artists, designers, programmers, architects, and a lot of professionals for production. Currently, processing is available in Java mode, JavaScript, Python, Raspberry Pi, and Android mode. And in this tutorial, we'll be seeing a lot of examples using processing and PyKaido. So let's start by checking out examples that are using mathematics and algorithms, we'll see how we can create art pieces using simple mathematical functions like noise, trigonometry, we can use randomness, then we'll be using a lot of colors, filter methods, and shadows. So for any art piece in generative art, randomness is a major factor, and we need some method that provides us with a floating point number, floating random point number. So random method differs in different programming languages, but the main objective is to provide us a random floating point number between 0 and 1. And if we plot uh, various random numbers generated over a period of time and plotted a graph, we'll see some something similar like this where each random number has no relationship with the previously randomly generated number. So if we want to generate random numbers in processing, we can simply call the function random and which will be returning the value, the floating value between, the floating random value between 0 and 1, which excludes 1. And we can also provide a minimum and maximum. So by providing a minimum maximum as a parameter, we'll be getting a value between the minimum and the maximum, which excludes the maximum value. And simply providing a single value in the random function will be returning a value, random value between 0 and 1. And if you're not using processing, we can simply use a random for module in Python. Before we move forward and start exploring art pieces that uses vector operations, shapes, and other examples, we need to understand how exactly a canvas looks like when we are working on a generative art piece. So the canvas, it's like a 2D Cartesian plane where each point can be considered as a vector. Here we are talking about a vector in a 2D Cartesian plane, which is the distance between two points. As you see on the right hand side, we have a Cartesian plane and the point is denoted by x comma y, where x comma y stores instructions basically on how to get there from the origin to that point. We can further use linear algebra operations to perform actions like scaling, uh, linear transformations, rotations. Similarly, we can create a line from a point to the other on our canvas. 
and if you want to create a point and line in processing it's pretty simple and straightforward we just use the function inbuilt function point providing two parameters x and y which are the x and y coordinates from the origin and if you're using a 3d canvas we can provide x y z coordinates and if you want to find a distance between two points we'll be simply using dist and providing four parameters x1 comma y1 which is the coordinates of the first point and x2 comma y2 which is the coordinates for the second point similarly we can create a line between those two points by using line and providing the two points coordinates x1 comma y1 and x2 comma y2 this will create a line but to show the line on the canvas we need to have a stroke and a color so we'll be using the stroke function which will which takes a color parameter and the color can be a hex value or rgb value or an hsv value and we can also manipulate the width of the thickness of the stroke or the line by using stroke weight and provide by providing a parameter similarly we can use pi chiral to draw lines by using context which is basically the canvas so context that set underscore line underscore width and providing the width of the line which is a thickness and then in in pi chiral it works in this way like we just first tell the canvas to move to this point and from that point we can create a line to the other point so we can simply use move underscore 2 to the first point uh, coordinates and from there we can use line underscore 2 to move to the second uh, uh, the second point and create a line in between them and even and in the last we can just use context at stroke to create a line in between those two points so these art pieces have been using uh, by simple lines and dots of different thickness and intensity on the left hand side i have placed vertical lines of different lengths and different opacity along with dots at random positions to give it a nice noisy background on the right hand side in a single vertical column there are a number of small lines uh, which uses a large set of color palettes and have randomly used the colors to fill the stroke uh, instead of using simple uh, straight lines, we can also use vector operations. On the left hand side, it consists of dots on a horizontal line and the dots move to and fro as if the wind is blowing. This could be achieved by placing dots on a straight horizontal path. We continue this from top to bottom for a number of times. Uh, then instead of adding the points as a variable position we can create a p vector which is an inbuilt function in processing which is a collection of values that describe the relative position in space so we can change its position at any moment of time so we can have other vectors like velocity and acceleration vector as uh, we know velocity depends on acceleration and position depends on velocity a change in these vectors would eventually bring a change in the position vector so by doing these vector operations by changing the changing the value of changing a small value in acceleration uh, and velocity we can create a virtual wind effect and the points move in the direction of the wind on the right hand side instead of using the above uh, mentioned operations on the which we are using on the left hand side image uh, we can simply use the curve vertex which is an inbuilt function in processing that creates a curve between two lines and we can uh, use two points and create a curve so curve vertex is an implementation of a uh, catmull rom spline algorithm which is a type of interpolating spline that is a curve basic that basically goes through its point in processing it specifies the vertex coordinates for curves so this function can only be used in between begin shape uh, with no mode parameters and end, sh and in end shape so this function the begin shape and the end shape uh, basically allows creating complex form on a cartesian plane the second we have Bezier curves which is a versatile mathematical curve in our vector graphics uh, this is similar to what we use in our vector graphics tool like illustrator which are defined by a series of anchor and control points and if we use the curve vertex and Bezier curves at a single point or two points uh, over a period of time we can get a similar scribble like effect on the canvas that we can see in our piece so let's see how we can create some basic shapes and we'll see how we can use these basic shapes to create generative art so if you want to create an ellipse we can simply use the ellipse function by providing four parameters a b c and d where a and b are the uh, point coordinates 
on the canvas and C and D are the width and the height and if you want to create a rectangle we can provide uh, eight values or on which four are the compulsory value which are like A and B are the coordinates of the points A comma B and C and D are the width and the height and if you want to add radii to the radius for the corners we can either if you want the same radii on all four corners we can simply provide a value say radius radii and if you want different values at different uh, of different radius on each corner we can either provide the value of tl tr uh, br and bl which is the top left top right bottom right and bottom left and if we want to create a square we can simply use x and y uh, like we can provide three parameters x y are the coordinates of x comma y from where we'll start the square and c is the length of the side of a square similarly we can uh, use pi chiral to create shapes that we can see on the bottom linear interpolation is a very important function when we are working with creative coding or generative art it calculates a distance between two numbers at a specific increment and the amount is the amount to interpolate between the two points say if we want to interpolate between 0 and 1, 0 is equal to the first point, 0 0.1 is very near to the first point, 0 0.5 is the half in between, it moves on. So the lobe function is a inbuilt function processing which is convenient for creating motion along a straight path and for drawing dotted lines. And if you don't want to use processing and you don't want to use an inbuilt function, you can also uh, create your own function as lerp which will take three parameters, start, stop and amount and will return something like start multiplied by 1 minus amount plus n into amount. So we can use those simple shapes that we discussed in the previous slides. Here in these art pieces I'm using simple rectangles with various uh, random widths and using a large uh, color palette and randomly using those colors and filling those rectangles and eventually we get something like this and as these pieces are using randomly random width so each time you run the program uh, you will get completely different art pieces you can also uh, get inspiration from the another artist paintings like this uh, on the left hand side is an art piece by uh, Piet Mondrian it's named composition 2 in red blue and yellow and it's just using random uh, shapes like rectangles and squares and lines and on the right hand side I'm, I've used a similar procedure of using shapes uh, like rectangles and squares and created a similar art piece which uses randomly uh, aligned lines rectangles and using a large color palette and filling the rectangles and squares and also using a noisy background using the pull noise function which you'll see in the next slide so Ken Perlin developed the noise function while working on the original Tron movie in the 1980s. He used to create procedural text for computer generated effects. Unlike a random number generator that generates a random number between two numbers and has no relationship between the last number produced and show no discernible pattern. On the other hand, Perlin noise, uh, the number generated has a relationship between the last number generated and is more organic in appearance because uh, the numbers which are generated using Perlin noise are naturally ordered sequences of pseudo random numbers. And if you uh, generate a lot of uh, Perlin noise numbers and plot a graph, you will see that the graph is more smooth and organic. In processing, using uh, generating Perlin noise uh, is pretty simple. You can simply call the noise function, which returns the Perlin noise value at specified coordinates. It can compute 1D, 2D and 3D noise depending on the number of coordinates given. The resulting value will always be between 0 and 1 where XYZ are the number in those coordinates in noise space. The another, function, another important function while working with Perlin noise is the noise seed. So it sets the seed value for the noise function because by default noise function produces different results on each time the program is searched. So it sets it to a constant single value. And the third important function in processing is the noise detail which takes two parameters. The first being the number of octaves to be used by the noise and the second follow factor for each octave. Basically it adjusts the level of details produced by the Perlin noise function like the intensity, the fineness or maybe if you want to add a granular effect. 
using those Perlin and sim sub Perlin or simplex noise, we can create 2D field of vectors each with each pointing in a similar but different direction as its neighboring vectors and have the velocities affected by the vectors that we discussed previously. Depending on how we draw the particles during animation, we can generate some pretty cool stuff that we can see here. Instead of just using Perlin noise, we can also use Perlin uh, ins for instead of just creating Perlin noise waves, we can also create some noisy background or the granular effect using Perlin noise as we can see here. So in this art piece, uh, I have created a noise field and on the front uh, we have a grid with a background and a noise, a noisy background basically, which is using the Perlin noise generated random noise and which is eventually giving a granular effect. Let's see how geometry, fractals and chaos and how we can use the geometrical patterns, the fractals and simple chaos theory to generate aesthetic art pieces. On the right hand side, it's a geometric pattern which looks uh, pretty complex at first, but if it looks closely, it's just using circles of random uh, radius and with no fill and just stroke over a period of time and up to a sim uh, length of diameter. So the very basic and um, famous example of geometric pattern could be the Sierpinski gasket where we are recursively uh, dividing the triangle and creating smaller triangle in inside it. So which this is basically a equilateral triangle subdivided recursively into smaller equilateral triangle with one recursive call at each time. Uh, this example is pretty simple which is not using any kind of fill and just we are just filling the stroke uh, with a black color and we can like uh, do small transformation in the initial state and we can modify it into something like this where we are not just f uh, filling the stroke we are filling the, uh, the triangle and we are also using random values and rotating it the location we are rotating the triangles we are changing its location and instead of just using triangle we are using the curve vertex to add some sketchy effect on the outer surface this is a uh, example of a fractal uh, which looks like a flower so it's using four and different four different types of fractal and put together at a 360 degree and together it's giving something like this effect which uh, looks like a fractal basically a flower when we talk about fractal mandelbrot set is one of the most famous one and mandelbrot fractal or the mandelbrot set the more you zoom uh, the more similar patterns you see and the then that makes fractal so fascinating so it is represented on a complex plane where there is a coordinate system uh, and has complex number uh, you can see the equation here like z equals to x plus y i where i is the complex number the i the x y axis represents the real and the z axis represents the imaginary part so we pick a point in the coordinate plane and pass it to the equation and iterate it through uh, some n number of times and eventually we get the Mandelbrot set we can use different parameters like if we touch infinity we can change the color of the set otherwise it should be black and most of the fractals are similar in nature. We can also create a uh, Julia set, which in some manner is pretty sim sim uh, similar to the Mandelbrot set and is using the almost similar mathematical equation. If we go deeper into the Mandelbrot set, we will see the Mandelbrot set is extending outwards and is creating the bi this bifurcation diagram. This logistic map or the bifurcation diagram is basically a part of the Mandelbrot set and this uh, diagram only exists on the real line because we put only real numbers into our equation. This method was the first method to generate random numbers or computers and give rise to a very famous topic called a chaotic behavior. And to understand this chaotic behavior is pretty much simple. The chaos theory means like a simple change, a very small change in the initial state will result in very large difference in the final outcome. So on the right hand side, we are creating a fractal on the bottom left, we initially created this fractal with some simple parameters and changing uh, the initial parameters has uh, given the outputs which are totally different in shapes and sizes. When you're talking about chaos theory, attractors are the perfect example. 
these attractors are basically mathematical functions that tend to evolve over time and are represented by coordinates in space, each coordinate dependent upon the previous coordinate. The change between the two coordinates are based upon uh, mathematical equations per dimension. On the left hand side we have a Lorentz attractor, in the right hand side we have a de Jong attractor. Again a small change in the initial uh, state will bring a large change in the final outcome. So if we change the ABCD parameters uh, in the initial state of the de Jong attractor the output will be really different from what we see here. Let's see how we can simulate paint and how we can add some uh, oil paint or the water paint effect on our canvas. So to add such effects, I've created three different paintings. And to do this, I got the inspiration from an artist named Tyler Hopp. He has a blog post where he has explained in detail how we can use a deformation technique to add such effects. I've given the link uh, on the below. And to give you an overview, I basically created shapes, uh, first like a polygon, then started extending it uh, edges outwards to do this recursively by passing it to a deformation uh, function. And eventually we get a very fine detail on the outer part which can be seen on the third image. You can also add blur effects, work with the pixels, add overlay effects, um, maybe use pixel sorting that I'm using on the first image and you will get something similar. Let's talk how pixel sorting works. So pixel sorting is a famous uh, process of isolating a horizontal or the vertical uh, pixel in any image and sorting their position based on any number of criteria. So we take an image, we take its pixel, we load the pixels, we then we pick the original pixel position with the XSR function that we create, then we pick the next pixel position, change the number of signs and you will see a change in the direction then we compare it and swap the pixels according to the brightness so eventually uh, by sorting the pixels we get something similar to these and these are created using the artworks I've created in the past and these are another set of examples just using pixel sorting so now we can talk about genetic algorithms which is a part of evolutionary algorithms. So all aspects of our life are driven by computation and algorithms, how we learn, play, work, etc. Given the situation, we can say that generative art best reflects our time. To reflect this, artists have been using a technique called genetic algorithm to replicate images. This is basically an optimization technique that mimics the Darwinian law of natural selection and the survival of the fittest. So depending on what type of problem we are working with, we can we have to tailor the algorithm accordingly. Here, it's a given example. We are initially uh, setting a population with randomly, uh, random ellipses with random colors. And over generation and generation, it's learning uh, to replicate the original image. So the steps includes are they making the initial population, then finding the fitness function or by assigning a fitness value for selection, doing a crossover between the parents and mutating the genes. Even uh, unless uh, we just iteratively do this process, unless we get the optimized solution, here we are finding the optimized pixel value. So to, to know genetic, genetic algorithms in depth, uh, we basically start with the initial population so that we can have a initial generation and then we can generate our further generations. After that, we have a termination condition which checks if the individual is the best optimal solution or not. If it is not the best optimal solution, for, then we proceed it to the mating process. As there is a large uh, initial population, we can't select all the individuals, so we assign them with a fitness value such that the individuals below a specific level would be rejected. Uh, here we are working with the images, so we have to calculate the fitness We are how different each pixel's color is, its pixel value is basically. We can use tournament selection method for this. Once we have our fit parents, we do a crossover and once we have a new generation, we can also check for some mutation by altering uh, the genes of the newly created offsprings. This way we get the best optimal solution over some x n uh, number of generations and in our case the initial set of uh, shapes say polygon can replicate the original image. Here is an example that I've created using Pygame uh, processing in Python. Uh, 
which is replicating the image on the left hand side and it's using genetic algorithms and the program was run for 500 generations and if you run the program for more than that you will get a more concise and uh, proper image which looks exactly like the left one so these days artists are also using GANs which is generative adversarial networks uh, to create new forms of art to mix different arts and create new ones artists like Anna Riddler, uh, Helena Serin uh, Robbie Barrett, whose art piece can be seen on the slide, uh, which is called AI Fashion. And they're using uh, GANs to create new art forms these days. Uh, it uses two neural networks which are designed to think like a human being. Uh, the first being generator, a generator that generate pictures of abstract paintings. It looks at a large number of data sets of training data and tries to produce something that resembles a data but uh, taking uh, into account that the discriminator cannot tell it uh, if it was produced uh, by another network. And second is the discriminator. Uh, and discriminator is something that cannot tell the difference between the real and the fake abstract paintings. A uh, very um, simple and very concise example can be, we, we take two uh, pieces of art, say one is a painting of horse and the second is a painting of zebra. And we try to swap the faces and of each um, of the animal in the painting and create a new piece with a swap faces and yeah this is it thank you so much for watching the talk yeah